Click the subscribe button and click the notification bell and I'll pretend Fallout 76 never happened. Let's take a ride. I love driving. In fact, driving about two hours at night alone is an extremely relaxing thing to me. Turn up the volume on some scary story podcasts, become transfixed by the passing trees along the side of the road, and tremble in fear as you wonder who that is in your back seat. You were supposed to be alone after all. These are allegedly real road trip horror stories. If you want to hear your story in an episode of Darkness Prevails, share it with us at darknessprevails.org. We're looking for scary snowstorm or blizzard stories, or let me know in the comments what you want to hear next. Also, be sure to check out my podcast at dppodcast.com. Click the iTunes link and leave an honest review to help us get to 500 ratings. Thank you. Wicked Warning From Lady Rain AK Location, New Orleans I was trucking down in the States with my ex. We had traveled coast to coast and had many weird experiences along the way. But this experience was rather freaky and possibly paranormal. It happened in New Orleans at the beginning of August 2005. We had finally made it to New Orleans, the home of Voodoo and Mardi Gras. Ever since my brother told me about their graveyards, the voodoo shops, and the other strange but fun things down there, I had to go see it for myself. Call it morbid curiosity or just simply fascination with the macabre. Either way, I wanted to go. I heard the mausoleums and headstones are beautiful, and the local lore had me interested. Not to mention I had just gotten a new 35mm camera, and I had taken a few photography classes in high school, so I wanted to capture the memories in the best way I knew how. I know, 35mm was old school even back in 2005, but there was something about not knowing immediately how the shot would come out, not having instant gratification, that made me feel like I was some sort of real artist. We had dropped the trailer at the Home Depot we were unloading at, and drove down to Lafayette Cemetery. We zigged and zagged through the streets in complete awe of the old plantation-style homes. There was this one ginormous home in particular that looked like it could house at least half a football team. The place was utterly beautiful, but something about it made me feel uneasy. I'm sure a lot of horrible things happened down there, so we didn't stop, and we drove right on by. My ex did not, and I mean did not, like anything unknown, anything spiritual, or mildly occult-like. So he flat out refused to go with me, stating it was boring, but I could see that he was actually creeped out. Pulling into a nearly empty street, I had half expected there to be tons of people there, as what I had gathered this was supposed to be a tourist attraction. Since it was a residential area, we couldn't park the bobtail truck here, he tossed me my cell phone, which had like 15 minutes of prepaid call time left, and said to call him when I was done. He basically dropped me off at the gate and sped away like a complete chicken. The mausoleums looked like finely built homes, sitting there on stone pads, some of them growing moss and others had fresh flowers at their stoops. Walking the stone paths that weaved through the hollow ground, there was a complete ominous feeling like I was being followed. It filled me with dread and excitement. The hairs on my neck stood up, and a chill ran through my body, causing my very existence to run cold. It was borderline 90 degrees outside, but I was shivering. I continued along the path, clicking away on my camera, taking pictures here and there of the weeping cherub angels and the praying figures that marked the headstones. I must have lost track of time as the sun was beginning to dip down over a particularly unnerving set of trees. I had forgotten we were in the south and the possibility of a snake or something just as freaky falling on that tree dawned on me and I began to make my way back to the gate. The towering gate looked even more sinister in the dimming light. I quickened my pace 
and soon spotted a lady of African descent. She was probably nearing 80 years old and appeared very frail looking with a bright colored outfit and her gray hair peeked out of a bandana type headdress. Necklaces of what appeared to be wood or possibly bone were draped around her neck. I must have startled the poor woman because she snapped her head towards my direction in such a swift movement. I was nearly startled myself. I was surprised she didn't break her neck. She was looking at me straight in the face now. I noticed then that she had one milky eye. The other was darting back and forth like it was searching for something to focus on. She had appeared so quickly. I was visibly shaken. She probably sensed my fear. I rationalized with myself that it was totally possible she was leaning down to put flowers on the nearby grave, but as I got closer to where she was, I didn't see any flowers. She motioned for me to come over, and despite my gut feeling, I walked cautiously over to where she stood. I assumed she simply needed help getting up or help to her car or something. I was trying to be the good citizen and get my good karma points for the day. I thought that I was far enough away that if for some reason I needed to bolt, I could, but I was apparently within arm's length of her now. She was swifter than a freaking lion when she grabbed me by the arm so tight that she left bruises on my forearm. Her nails dug into my skin, but I could barely let out more than a squeak of terror. She pulled me towards her leathery face and milky eye. Her good eye was almost solid black the whites that were left had yellowed over time. Small serpents of red slithered across her face. She smelled of rotting leaves and iron. She smelled like decay. She spoke in a very deep, I've smoked three packs a day for 40 years deep, raspy voice, saying, Get out. Excuse me? This is a public place, right? I'm just visiting, I don't mean any harm, I managed to say to her. Pulling me closer to her face, I could see her gnarly, snarled teeth. The few that were left were tobacco-stained and barely hanging on for dear life. Her hot breath was pungent. I swallowed back a gag. Leave this place, or you will drown for your sins. I then hear off in the distance, Hello? Are you there? Do you need me to come pick you up? I had a ninja grip on my phone, apparently, which I had subconsciously dug from my bag in a panic while the old lady had me in her clutches. I didn't remember entering his number, though, and we didn't have each other's numbers on speed dial, so the fact that my ex was on the other line was a blessing in disguise. Just as quickly as she snatched me, she let me go, almost forcibly throwing me to the ground. She was surprisingly strong for someone who appeared to be so frail. I walked to the outside gate, waiting on the curb for my ex to come around the corner. It was getting much darker, and the chirping of crickets started off in the distance. I could still see the lady pacing back and forth at the grave. She was watching me. Her mouth was still moving like she was talking to herself or perhaps cursing me. The chicken lights of the truck came into view and I was finally safe. The hero of the story showed up on his white horse to save me, or in this case, the yahoo in a purple bobtail Peterbilt jerked to an abrupt stop as I nearly jumped into the street to get away from that cemetery. I flung the door open in one fell swoop, and I hopped into the front seat, slamming the door shut. Looking confused, my ex asked me if I was okay, why I looked so scared. Then a wry smile formed on his face as he began to poke fun at me, saying that I was the one getting scared, that I was afraid of the dark. He told me he knew it was a bad idea to visit the place of those that had passed. I told him what had happened with the old lady and exclaimed, Heck yeah, I was scared. That old woman was freaky. He looked at me blankly and asked, What lady? Then he motioned toward the gate. The woman was gone, as if within the past few seconds she vanished. There were no other cars in the street, and it was empty besides the idling semi-truck we were in. There was only one way in and out, 
and we were parked right in front of it. If anyone would have come through the gate, we would have seen them. I stressed to my ex we needed to leave the state, telling him the old lady had warned me. But he didn't believe it, but went along with it as we headed out of the south. After that, we ended up stopping in Georgia and even in Northern California at one point, then along to Biloxi, Mississippi. And within those two weeks of almost constant driving, Hurricane Katrina hit. Maybe the old woman was right. Had I not listened to her in the Lafayette Cemetery, we may have very well been casualties to Hurricane Katrina. Truck Stop Horror Another experience from Lady Rain, A.K. Location Roads Across America I lived in a small town, and I never really traveled outside of my home state. I never experienced life in a way that others would. We were kind of sheltered from the big crime and other things that had been happening over the countryside. So my now ex decided to take me on a journey of being an over-the-road truck driver. In a lot of cases, this was a great experience. There were a lot of fun times, and I got to see most of the United States. But trucking life is hard and being on the road 24-7 is not easy. Being cooped up in a small truck with someone for that long will cause anyone to become mad, as in bad crap crazy. Life on the road is much different now than it was when I was trucking. People now have better tech, and the ability to binge watch your favorite YouTube channel, surf the web, or play games on your phone to keep yourself occupied. The only forms of entertainment we had back then was either watching one of the dozen or so DVDs, reading yet another book, or talking on the radio. We often opted for talking on the radio, which became our version of social media. We even had different identities or personas to hide behind while interacting with the different people who were basically strangers to us, and I think we all know how creepy certain truckers can be. We kept a bit of anonymity on our side to stay safe on the road, when you're a trucker, you acquire a CB handle. My ex's was Ninja Dwarf, and mine was Northern Exposure, as I was from Alaska. During the time on the road, you meet a lot of crazy people, and you see a ton of crazy stuff, and I do mean a ton. People often hear about stories of things that happen on the road. Most of them are more gross than scary. You know, like drivers getting a little too friendly with their cabin buddy whether it's a dog, a cat, or even a goat. Because yeah, crazy stuff happens on the road. And I saw it by accident firsthand a few times. But those are stories for a different time. This time was one of the most terrifying experiences of my entire life. When it comes to strange and unusual events, this world is full of them, and I got lucky enough to be a part of it. Have you ever gotten the heebie-jeebies from someone's voice? Like, flat-out scared to talk to someone. A voice that makes you think that the person on the other line is not at all there, you know. That was this guy. Something about him just made my skin crawl, and I had only ever heard his voice through the crackle of the CB radio. The CB started to crackle, and we heard the distant call. You could barely hear a voice through the static, but eventually he got close enough we could hear him clearly. He must have been 50 miles or so behind us, because it was still faint, but our CB radio was peaked and tweaked, meaning it could really reach out and touch someone, kind of like when everyone's got 3G and you're running 5G. We could just barely hear him through the chatter of the CB, and then I finally really heard his voice. It's hard to explain, but the best way I could now describe it would be like how Heath Ledger talks as the Joker in the Batman movie, like a slurred voice through gritted teeth that had been smiling for hours. There was something just off about it, and it gave me chills. He said to us, Hey there, Purple Pete, which was the color of our truck. Where are you headed? My ex hollered back that we were heading to Arkansas, the driver said he was going the same way and asked if he could tag along and introduced himself as Maniac, 
we would run from one coast to another, then back again. This guy always seemed to be running the same route as us, but we had never physically seen his truck, though he described it as a 378 long-nosed Peterbilt that was black and had a brow and a cattle guard. According to him, he ran dry box from California to Florida, which explained why he always seemed to be either coming or going on the I-10. One week when we were running from Florida back to LA, we actually caught up to him on his back trip from Redmond, Washington to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He told us he would meet up with us in Nevada when we did our trip back, because by then, we would have run out of hours and needed to take a rest. We said sure to him, even though I really did not want to meet this guy. But my ex seemed to really like him, so we gave him an ETA on when we'd be back in that area and what truck stop we would be at. We were going to meet up with him for a meal. This was really before the idea of having a cell phone for anything other than emergencies, so it wasn't like we could just call him when we were going to be in the area. He agreed and we parted ways. My ex continued to talk to him until the radios would no longer reach. We had finished our load that day and were heading back to Las Vegas to the truck stop, the one we had agreed it upon and waited. Las Vegas is a shady place for truckers in general. There's often quite a bit of crime there. I've seen my fair share of cops live while in truck stops, and I mean right in front of my face. Watching them do sting operations is pretty entertaining to say the least. We waited in the truck for what seemed like forever, until we got bored and ventured into the truck stop for a bit. We waited and waited, until eventually we passed enough time where we could take another load, so we had to head out. We never actually met up with the guy in Nevada. But a few months later, we ran into him in Oklahoma. We had heard some chatter on the radio about these lot lizards, truck stop girls you could pay for if you catch my drift, whose lives had been brutally stolen at truck stops in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Tennessee. Folks on the radio chalked it up to drama, but at the time, none of us had anything better to do than make up truck driver stories. We kept hearing about it though, and even brought it up to Maniac the next time we heard from him. I remember he laughed about it. <laughs> Must be one real sicko doing it. Must just be a story, because if it was true, they would have caught him already. I'm sure there's tons of fingerprints and fluids at the crime scene. With as messy as the crime scenes were, I'm sure he wants to be caught. That seemed like a really weird thing to say. But he was a very weird guy, so that was totally in character for Maniac. Maniac went his way and we went ours, and after a while I forgot about the weird comment. Fast forward a few weeks later, we were in Mississippi, and we hear a familiar voice on the radio, and it was Maniac. We had taken a long weekend, because it was Labor Day, and most companies were okay with drivers taking an extra day off then. Our plan was to make it to this lake out in the middle of nowhere. We were going to drop our trailer off and head out Bobtail. So we chatted with Maniac and he said he was going to Tennessee and that he would be heading out the next morning. And so cutting our much needed break short and bypassing the weekend at the lake, my ex decided to run with him so that there was someone to talk to. We had gotten into an argument earlier and I wasn't talking to him and he absolutely hated the silent treatment. They chatted and I tried to ignore the conversations, but I couldn't help but overhear that the topic changed to the truck stop lot lizards. My ex tried to be a hard A, and he straight up told Maniac that he wasn't scared of the guy, and that he could defend himself from a sicko like him. But then I remember hearing him say, <laughs> It's not you he's after. He said it with this raspy chuckle then they quickly changed the subject. Our load was to be delivered in North Carolina in a few days, so being a few hours ahead of the deadline just meant we would be at the top of the line to pick up our load. It was a win-win. We left the following morning. The guys decided we would stop in Tennessee and finally meet each other, 
all this after six months of chatting. By then, we weren't so afraid to meet up with the guy, except for me. I was still very on edge about it. I was no slouch, and I grew up with 15 boys in the house. It was a big household, and I was quite the fighter because I had to be. My ex was a larger dude too, standing six foot three and about 280 pounds. So in theory, we were ready for anything. The only way someone could get the best of us is if they were prepared or armed, which back then was highly illegal to have in the trucks. And if you were caught by the Department of Transportation, it would be jail time, no questions asked. With our company, we had very specific fuel stations we could use to top off at but Maniac was an owner-operator, so he could go anywhere. Maniac said he'd already stopped to get fuel and took a shower, but he would drop his trailer off and meet us at a Flying J patrol station that was down the road from where he was, which I believe was a Love's fuel station. So we get ready to fuel up, and we showered. Then we got a booth at the restaurant. We waited about 45 minutes before ordering food, once more, we waited and waited. No one ever showed up, and there was no way to contact him besides getting close enough to him over the CB radio, which at this point was going to be random. My ex was not a patient man, so we ate and headed back out to the truck. You could tell, too, that he was obviously irritated with being stood up for a second time by the same guy that claimed to be his friend. I remember it being a dark and humid night. It was probably 10 p.m. There wasn't much for noise in the truck stop, which was unnerving. A quiet truck stop is a creepy truck stop. We walked across the fuel island to be greeted to a crap ton of flashing lights. Several cops, state troopers, a coroner's van, a fire truck, and two ambulances. All of which, if they had lights, they were flashing. It was quite the spectacle and completely unexpected. It's not uncommon for either lizards to get busted or drivers to get involved in crap they are not supposed to, so we didn't think much of it. Cops in a truck stop go hand in hand after all, but this was more than just your typical truck stop shenanigans. Something major was going down, and the truck stop was now suddenly a buzz. We passed 12 trucks or so, this was one of the bigger Flying J's, so it could probably fit about 80 trucks and trailers in the lot if you went all the way back to the dirt. And then you could probably Tetris a dozen or so trucks in the dirt lot, which happened to be where our truck was. Now, I'm a curvy girl, and I wouldn't call myself fat, but I definitely don't look like I belong in a truck stop. I was used to drivers looking at me all creepy-like. I always got taunted and harassed for being a lot lizard even though I was a driver. In fact, there are some truck stops that are not safe for me to walk in alone. I was walking with my ex, and we weren't holding hands or anything, but it was obvious that I was with him. We walked down a row and saw a bobtail truck parked in a full parking spot. I thought it was weird, as he had no trailer, but he was in a spot for one. Typically, bobtail trucks will park at the end of a run and leave the big spaces for trucks with trailers, because that was again another unspoken truck driver rule. We moved by the bobtail truck. It was a dark truck, maybe a dark black or blue with a cattle guard and a brow. I don't remember seeing what type of truck it was. Old school trucker code was if you were looking for company, the driver would park and leave his reading red light on to tell lot lizards that the driver was looking for entertainment. The guy was sitting in the passenger seat, and he had the red reading light on, so I could see his face. It was a bit distorted, but he gave me the creepiest smile, and then quickly shut his blinds. We were about six trucks down from the bobtail. I could see his truck from ours, and I remember looking back and seeing the red light still illuminating through the porthole window in the passenger door. There was a small slit down the curtain showing a dark spot, and I could see eyes. The guy in the truck was still watching us. Even with as warm as it was, chills flew up my spine, and I felt uneasy. My gut wrenched with a sudden feeling of dread. 
I honestly thought I was going to get sick. We finally got back to the truck and turned on the CB for our night of entertainment and to see if we could radio Maniac to see what the deal was in the lot. The chatter was about all the cops and the ambulance, fire truck, and DOT. All the commotion seemed to be across from us, but two rows up. People were saying that they found a body, a lot lizard, and that it was bad, like gnarly and brutal. One driver started trying to explain it, but he was then told that he had to keep his mouth shut by a police officer. Being nosy though, my ex and I jump out of the truck to go investigate. We dodged in and out of the trucks and managed to wiggle our way up to the scene. You know when you hear the phrase, some things can't be unseen. This was one of them. The lady, what was left of her, had been tied to the trailer in the truck. Then someone pulled the kingpin, that piece that locks the two together, and let down the landing gear. The driver, who was now sitting in the back of a police car, handcuffed, his head hung limp with his forehead on the back of the seat, was crying big heavy sobs, and there was vomit on his shirt. We could hear them through the closed door. He was screaming that he had nothing to do with it and praying to God to be forgiven for what he had done. That poor driver had obviously not done his safety check before he left and just decided to pull out of his space while she was attached. Without getting too graphic, I can tell you that a normal human body should never look like that. It was like something you would see from a Saw film. I remember stumbling back and bumping into another driver. He just looked at me, pale, and looked as if he was going to get sick. I don't do well with that body function, so I moved quickly away from him and started making my way back to the truck. I was basically running back, without even thinking about having my ex with me. I made it to the truck and tugged on the door, but it wouldn't open. So I ran to the truck stop full speed. I was going to be sick, and I'd rather not have people see me or watch me. I passed the spot where the bobtail truck was parked, and I noticed it was gone. My ex made it into the truck stop looking for me. He said he would walk me back to the truck, so I could get some rest and forget about this awful night. Yeah, right. Like I could sleep after that. He turned on the radio and began to talk to the other drivers. No one else had seen much. There hadn't even been much lizard traffic. The police had been working overtime that night, cleaning up the truck stops after they had caught wind of the first few crime scenes. I sat in the bunk and just kind of stared out of the windshield at the flashing lights. There was a tap on the door all of a sudden, and it nearly made me jump through the roof. A police officer said he was getting statements from everyone at the truck stop. He gave us the rundown about safety and numbers, and to not go anywhere alone. I wasn't even planning on leaving this truck. I told him about the creepy guy that smiled at us in the bobtail truck, and I gave him a description of the truck. But the officer didn't see the point of me telling him about a creepy guy but he took down the information anyway. I don't think I slept for days after that. I just kept seeing the image of that woman. Flashes kept going through my head. The vivid image of her face, the red rag that was in her mouth, and the 100 mile per hour tape around her wrists tying her to the headache rack. She had obviously struggled because there were bruises formed on her stomach and her face. Mascara was running down her cheeks and that smell of iron. I can barely recount this story to you without being queasy. It didn't seem to faze my ex much. He went on like it wasn't anything big or special. After a few weeks, I finally managed to get the image out of my head, or I had finally convinced myself that it wasn't real. It was just a scene from a scary movie. Yeah, that's what it was. Either way, I was glad for the time being, having it out of my head. Fast forward to February, about three months after that incident, and we were heading to New Orleans. I was super excited to see the area, and hopefully get in to see the Mardi Gras. I wanted to visit the cemeteries to see the mausoleums and go into the voodoo shops and such. We had an extra few hours to spend there, so I was happy when my ex said we could go wandering around for a bit. 
we parked at this little truck stop. It was one that didn't show up on the big Rand McNally maps. We were told about it by another driver. It really wasn't more than a hole in the wall, a ma and pa shop with a small dirt lot and a flickering light pole on one end, but it was within walking distance of the French Quarter, which was where I wanted to go. Hey there, Purple Pete. What brings you out all this way? The voice on the CB radio was loud, so he was really, really close. There were only two other trucks in the lot, an old freight liner hauling a swift trailer and a dark green Kenworth that had a cattle car in the back hauling cows. My ex was still a bit miffed about being stood up months ago. He could really hold a grudge when he wanted to. Maniac, man, where the heck have you been? Why'd you stand us up back there, buddy? My ex radioed back. Ah, man, you know how it is. Cops make me a bit uneasy, and I'd rather not get caught. <laughs> caught. What do you mean, man? My ex questioned. Don't worry about it. You just keep an eye on that girl of yours. I'd really hate for something bad to happen to her. Like all of those other girls. We watched the CB key up, again burying the needle on the radio. The signal was so high, it had to be in the same freaking truck stop. <sighs> Maniac was keyed up, but just kind of breathing into the mic. You know, I really like to play with them before I destroy them. Nasty. They're so nasty, so dirty, so defiled. You know they had it coming. It sounded like he was talking through gritted teeth. His voice was louder than before. We could hear the rumble of a truck heading down the one-way street that ended in the truck stop. We looked at each other. This was the only time I'd ever seen anything like fear in my ex's eyes. Tears began to well up in mine, and for the first time I was truly scared. A dust cloud came rolling up into the truck stop, and this dark, black, menacing Peterbilt with a cattle guard and a brow came rolling by slowly. The driver keyed up just as he went past the nose of our truck. It was that same creepy guy Creepy eyes, creepy smile from the truck stop months ago. He twisted that freaking grin at me as he put the mic up to his lips. Be safe out there, you two. I'd hate to run into you again. His CB handle was pinstriped on his driver door, saying maniac in bright red letters. We reported this to the police, though there wasn't a very big search going on for him. Guess there wasn't enough concrete evidence beyond what he said to us. In April of 2004, we headed back to Alaska because my ex's father had a massive heart attack. We stayed there for a while before heading back onto the road. As far as I know, there were seven total scenes or incidents. There could have been more. Who knows how long he had actually been doing this. I don't know if the guy was ever caught and I found evidence online about the other incidents, but never any answer on if he was still out there. I can tell you one thing, though. The second time around, I wasn't making friends with anyone on the road, and I always kept a six-inch blade on me at all times, just in case I ever saw a maniac again. Something in the Blue Mountains from KW, location, northwest of Sydney in the Blue Mountain region. I'm a 21-year-old guy from Australia. This happened a month ago as I was returning from a wedding along the central coast, which was a two or so hour drive north of Sydney, and I live just west of the Blue Mountains, a mountainous region west of Sydney, and a rather beautiful place. There's a pretty direct highway that connects my hometown to where I was attending this event, so it's a pretty straightforward drive on any other day that I've done countless times before. On this particular night, I was driving home alone from a long day as I had work the next morning. It was 1am by the time I'd gotten halfway through my drive in Sydney, and due to an accident earlier in the day, 
My route was redirected to a side road that I was very unfamiliar with, but I thought nothing more of it. As I was driving with the windows down and the music blasting, I noticed my car was getting very hot, very fast. Granted, it was a hot day on the coast where I was, but I thought it would be best to pull over and let it cool down. As I stopped the car and got out to stretch my legs, I was admiring the beautiful night view that I had of Sydney behind me, when I felt strange. It's difficult to explain, really, but I had suddenly felt so unsafe and unwelcome where I was. I tried to ignore it, so I checked my radiator to see if it was leaking or needed refilling and got back in the car to continue my drive. I had only gotten about 40 or so minutes further in the drive when this huge amount of smoke started coming from my bonnet. I pulled over straight away, popped open the hood, and after the smoke had cleared, I noticed something leaking underneath the car. I know that the car was fine when I had left the wedding. I'm very careful about making sure everything is as it needs to be for a long drive like this, so this was very unexpected. I didn't know what to do. I was beginning to panic. I needed help, but I hadn't seen another car since leaving the city. Amongst my worry, that feeling of unease came back like a ton of bricks. I did not want to be there. I didn't feel safe, but I could not keep driving like this. I eventually gathered myself after getting a call from my partner who was checking on my drive. I had explained the situation to him, and I was told to hang tight for about two hours or so while he came to get me. This was not ideal, but it was better than risking a drive and having a possible accident. So there I was, on the side of a dark road in the middle of the night, waiting. You'd better believe I was nervous, on edge. It wasn't from the bush surrounding me or the animals running about. I'm from the country, and I was very used to all of this. That part didn't really bother me at all. What bothered me was this intense, I mean really intense feeling of being stared at and whoever was doing it, I felt like they were angry. I couldn't shake it and with every passing moment it was just getting worse and worse to the point that I had locked every door and just sunk into my seat with my headphones in, pretending that I was not there. After what felt like an hour, I saw a set of headlights coming over the hill down the road towards me, and I had a brief moment of relief before I heard what I can only explain as a very heavy and very loud pop off the roof of my car, like something had jumped off of it after being completely unheard. It absolutely terrified me, and I started crying hysterically. I was crying and shaking more than I'd ever experienced when my partner knocked on the window to snap me out of it, I opened the door for him and cling to him for dear life, begging that we leave and that we can come back for the car another day. I just did not want to stay here anymore. It didn't take too much to convince him, though. We were walking into his car when we both heard this ungodly screech from the bush next to us. It wasn't any animal I'd ever heard, and the sound of it gave me this feeling like my soul was being ripped from me. We basically jumped in the car and floored it towards home without looking back. It wasn't until we left that section of mountains and started reaching the towns closer to our home that I finally felt safe enough to let my guard down and close my wary eyes. I haven't been comfortable enough to drive at night since coming home. I felt watched since, and I've even moved our Kelpie mixed puppy to our room for safety and company as he was recently attacked and lost a leg from what I assumed to be a larger dog only a few days after I got home. The only problem with this, though, is that we live in the suburbs, and my neighbors all own nothing but small house dogs and cats. My partner went to get my car out in those mountains with a good friend a day after, and found that my roof had a heavy dent in it. He described it as roughly the size of a large grown man in length, right above the driver's seat. Something had been sitting above me the entire time I'd been waiting. Ah, as for the heating issue, we found out that one of the hoses beneath the car had been punctured, 
We had it repaired, and I haven't had an issue since. I may have had something driving back to explain the hole, which is the most logical explanation. But that dent on top of the car, the feeling of something watching me, being close and hateful, the feeling that my life was in danger, combined with that soul-crushing screech. This event is not something that I can easily explain away. The people I've told suggested I may have just been paranoid, and I heard a possum, but I know what a possum sounds like, and they are not heavy enough to dent my car like that. I don't feel safe outside anymore, and I don't like my pup being outside unwatched. I can only hope whatever is causing all of this will go away. My trip to Colorado from Edwin. Location, Buena Vista, Colorado. I'm a 24-year-old truck driver from San Antonio, Texas. I've been driving for about three years now, and aside from traffic jams and the DOT driving behind me, there's not much that worries me. I was sitting at home watching TV when I got a text from dispatch saying that I was to head to Grand Junction, Colorado that weekend to deliver Monday morning. No problem, I thought. It was a short drive and I had plenty of time to get there. I took off late Saturday night, almost midnight actually, but whatever, I had more than enough time to make the delivery. Everything was going smooth. Since I was driving during the night, I avoided all that traffic in Austin and Dallas. I was making good time and was generally relaxed until I got a call from the receiver who informed me that there was a rock slide on I-70 and that I'd have to find a different route through a state that I'd never been to before, but whatever. I kept driving on I-70 until I got just west of Denver, at which point my GPS directed me south to an alternate route. Well, this is where crap started to suck. Two lane roads, curvy hills up and down, pulling a fully loaded 53 foot trailer. It was hell. But it wasn't until I got near Buena Vista, Colorado, that things got creepy. It was probably 10 or 11 p.m. Sunday night, and I was driving on some empty road in the middle of nowhere in the wintertime. I kept getting this feeling that I was being watched, but I ignored it. I was probably tired and paranoid from a long drive. So there I am driving in the middle of nowhere, when I hear the passenger seat release air. This has never happened before, I turn to look and no one's there, of course. I'm just paranoid, I tell myself again. Around 1 a.m. Monday morning, I pulled into a truck stop in Buena Vista, Colorado, and I went inside to take a leak and get a Mountain Dew kickstart to help wake me up. As I'm talking with the cashier, I mention the I-70 road closure and about how it was strange there, about the strange gust of air. Then he says to me, surprisingly, Yeah, buddy, you're not the only one. I heard a lot of truckers have said the exact same thing. That patch of road there is actually a hot spot for weirdness. I replied, Well, I guess I'll just stick around till daylight. I paid for my stuff, then went back to my truck, taking a two-hour nap until 6 a.m. around sunrise. I got to the delivery station around noon, and once I unloaded, I drove across the street to the Love's truck stop. Then I got some rest and woke up to a rhythmic honking. I was just about to curse the jerk out when I realized the honking was coming from my truck. I turned the truck off and it was still honking. It didn't stop until that part was taken out. I told another trucker about my experiences and he smiled, kindly saying, I'd say a prayer before you take off, and I'd take a different route on your way home. Most truckers aren't as lucky to get past that area. That sent chills up my spine. It wasn't until I did some Googling that I realized just how haunted Colorado was. This may not be the scariest story ever, but dang, I'll never go back to Colorado if I'm driving a truck. Let my boss fire me. I don't want to go back like that. The Old Lady in the Cabin, from Ida, location, Sweden. 
I'm 21 years old and I'm from Norway. This happened when I was 13 or 14 years old. Me, my mother, my sister, and her two daughters went on a road trip to Sweden one summer. We rented a cabin for two nights before driving back home. The journey went well, and after 13 hours, we finally arrived at the resort where the cabin was located. We got the keys for a small wood cabin with four beds and a small bathroom, but the beds in the cabin were full of dog hair, and since me and my sister are both allergic, we had to get a new cabin. We got the keys to a big red house in the middle of the resort. One bathroom, kitchen, living room, and two bedrooms. It was beautiful, and I looked forward to staying there for the two days and spend time with my family. My mom and I got the bedroom on the second floor. My sister and her daughters had the room right below us. That night, we went out for shopping and came back with food for a big barbecue, as well as candy and breakfast for the next day. It was getting dark outside, so we decided to have the barbecue before it got too dark. My mom and my sister made the food, and the kids, including myself, played some games on the lawn while we waited for the food to be ready. For some reason, I kept getting this weird feeling. I kept looking up toward the window upstairs of the cabin, as if at any moment I was going to see something creepy. But I never saw anything. Well, at one point in our game, my sister joined us. But as she sat down with us, she started doing it too. I noticed it almost right away. She kept watching the same window as me. I said it was cold outside and I wanted to eat in the kitchen because I was too scared to look up at that window again from outside. We sat in the kitchen around a table, playing cards and listening to music. The girls were dancing around and we had a really good time. I got the feeling that I was being watched again. I gave in to the urge to look up the staircase, which you could see from the kitchen. It was extremely dark upstairs, so I couldn't see much of anything. But I was sure something was up there looking back down at us. Something had to be causing this feeling. My mom even commented that she felt something wrong, or someone watching her as well, and I finally felt safe enough to admit that I felt the same. We were all creeped out that night, and we decided to go to bed afterward. My mom and I were sharing a double bed. There was one window in the room right next to the side of the bed on my side. We set up talking for a bit, but decided to sleep as we had a long day of shopping ahead of us. After a while of trying to sleep, my sister called my mom and told us to keep it down. They said they were hearing someone walking around upstairs and in the staircase. My mom told her that we'd been sleeping and that no one was on the staircase. No one had been walking around. I woke up later in the middle of the night and I opened my eyes. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There was an old woman standing next to my bed and she was staring down at me through glasses and locks of white curly hair. She had a white dress and a clock on her arm she was simply staring at me. I was so tired after the journey that I just closed my eyes again, turned around, and fell back to sleep. That morning, we sat around the table eating our breakfast. My oldest niece told us that she didn't want to stay in the house any longer. She then admitted that she saw an old woman in her bedroom when she was trying to sleep. When I heard that, my heart nearly stopped and I told her right away that I saw the same. We decided to ask the people working there if there were other people who saw the same thing as us. My mom and I walked down to the main house while my sister packed up our stuff ready to leave. My mom told the girl behind the desk what happened, and the girl said to us that we were the fourth people in a week saying the same thing. She also told us that the big red house was the main house a long time ago, the whole resort was built on a burned-down farm, and the main house was the only thing surviving the fire. An old couple perished there while they tried to save the animals. We told her we wanted to move out and get placed in a small wooden cabin for the last night. She gave us the new keys, and we walked back up to my sister to tell her the news. While moving to the other cabin, 
my youngest niece had to use the bathroom, so I said I could follow her and watch over her while she was in that creepy house. She was scared too and liked the idea. I waited outside the bathroom door and heard her finish up and unlock the door, but the door would not move at all. We both panicked, trying to yank it open, but it was stuck. Eventually, it did open, and we both quickly ran outside in fear of what just happened. We came back from shopping a few hours later and saw that a new family moved into that big red house already. They played outside and had a good time, and I couldn't help but feel bad for them since they had to stay in that haunted house. That night, we had to go to bed early as we had a 13-hour drive back to Norway afterwards. We all slept in the same room. As I was falling asleep next to my youngest niece, she suddenly said, as if to no one in particular, Good night, Olga. We asked her who Olga was, and she said it was the old woman that lived in the red house. 6 a.m. the next morning, we were ready to head home. We drove past the red house and saw all the people standing outside the house on the lawn. They had a newborn with them, and it was screaming and crying loudly. They stopped our vehicle and asked if we knew what was going on with that house. My mom said yes, and she admitted to them why we moved out after just one night. Then we drove away, never looking back. The Shoe in the Riverbed from Tauntaun Tom. Location, Carlsbad, New Mexico. This happened a few years ago. I had been through a tough divorce from my high school sweetheart, and my best friend, Al, distracted me by going on random road trips with me. One morning, we decided to just jump in my car and drive to a small community called Carlsbad, New Mexico. At this point in my life, I always had a digital camera with me. I loved to take pictures at random, thinking myself an amateur photographer. Along the way, we stopped at a small roadside gas station souvenir stand and picked up some cherry cider. When we made it to Carlsbad, we saw that they had dammed off a small local river and had pumped it so they could work on the bridges. We found a spot at a park nearby and parked, drinking the cider and snacking on some treats we bought before we decided to explore the dried riverbed. We were not the first to decide this, as there were obviously footprints everywhere. There were people's footprints, dogs' and cats' footprints, and even what looked like javelina tracks. There was something suspicious about the place. As I looked around, Al caught my attention. Hey, he said, waving me over. Check this out. There was a bone on the ground, and it looked like a spinal column, but from what exactly, I couldn't tell. What do you think that belongs to? Al asked as we stared at it. Probably a beef or pork bone of some kind. I replied, snapping a picture, then kept walking, thinking nothing more of it. As we continued, we found a strange rust-colored rock jutting out of the soft sand. Al and I walked closer to it, and sticking out of the sand half buried was a little girl's shoe. Now at first it wasn't so strange, and feeling like joking around with Al, I told him that I was going to run and kick at it to see how far it would go. As I ran towards it, I stopped right in my tracks when I heard a small girl's voice. No, please don't. My heart pounded. I stood there looking around, trying to find who said that, but I found no one, and Al was looking at me confused. Dude, what's up? Why did you stop like that? I was still looking for whoever said that, as I replied. Didn't you, didn't you hear that? The little girl. Dude, no one said anything, he replied. Feeling a bit nervous, we continued to walk further. I couldn't shake the feeling that people were watching me, though. It was such a heavy sensation. There was like a slight physical weight to it. Suddenly, I saw Al stop in his tracks, and he pointed straight ahead. He said, Man, there's another bone up there. He was pointing to what looked like a broken femur laying on the sand. 
There were footprints around it as well, but other than that, it looked undisturbed. We stared at it, and Al whispered to me, Man, we shouldn't be here. I think that's a human bone. I agreed. The weight I was feeling was becoming overwhelming, and this bone did look very human. I took another picture, and we walked back to the car. Al called the non-emergency police number for Carlsbad. We told them what we saw, gave them our information, and were on our way home in no time. I had forgotten all about the bones and the rust-covered rock until a week later when Al called me. He had gotten a call from the Carlsbad police. The bones we found were indeed human, and though there were plenty of footprints around, no one else had reported it. They were human bones, and due to that, they began an investigation into them. Al told me that they had already questioned him. They asked about the rust-colored rock and how we found the bones. Afterwards, they explained that it wasn't a rock, but the remains of a pickup truck that had disappeared along with a family of three. There was a man, a woman, and their daughter. Upon investigation of the area, they found a shoe sticking out of the sand, and inside it were the skeletal remains of a girl's foot. Thinking back to that, it turned my skin to ice. Was the unseen voice I heard that of the girl's? My thoughts were interrupted as Al finished what he was saying. Anyway, he said, we helped close a cold case from the 80s, so I guess good job there. Well, I hope these scary road trip stories don't keep you from doing something quite fun and exciting. The next time you get the chance, grab your best friend or a family member and go on a road trip. It's like a cheap adventure. See new places, try new food. Just try not to get caught by any psychos. Try not to end up in a haunted hotel or cabin. And don't stay on the side of the road too long in one spot because that's when the monsters of the forests come, because they know that's where the food is. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails. If you want to hear your story in an episode, submit it at darknessprevails.org. We're looking for any stories, really, but specifically, stories from blizzards or snowstorms. If you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash darknessprevails and donate any amount. My patrons unlock access to ad-free MP3 downloads, and they get their names in the credits at the end of my videos. Or you can click the shop button below if you're on YouTube, or go to teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails and check out my creepy cool merchandise. Thank you. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video about 10 real encounters with shadow people. Sarah Shelton says, Hi, love you. I have a story, but I don't know if it's worth it. Sarah, it's always worth it. You can remain anonymous, and sharing your story usually has some sort of relief to it. Not to mention, you get to scare and thrill all kinds of viewers. So if you feel like it, share your story anytime. No rush. And remember, you don't have to put your real name to the story. Skylar Durant says, I've had a few experiences with these guys. They're creepy. So far, I haven't. And as much as I'd like to say that I hope it stays that way, I know that most people in their lifetimes experience sleep paralysis at least once, and a lot of these shadow people experiences happen when you're sleep paralyzed. Oh boy. Sweetheart Sonia says, plot twist, it really was just their shadow. Well, I guess that's plausible. People have been scared of their own shadows for decades, or should I say centuries, mm, millennia? Jose Chavez says, do you have 3XL size clothing? Well, if I'm seeing this right, Teespring says it sells these shirts and hoodies up to 5XL, so that's pretty awesome. Mostly Ghostly007 says, there's nothing like falling asleep to your videos to have those sweet sweat nightmares. Are you sure those are nightmares that are making you sweat? It's not those really soaky dreams? And Maria Gonzalez says, I shared my Hatman story, 
I wonder why it didn't make the cut. Well, Maria, I have over 360,000 fans now, and just this past weekend, I've received dozens of stories, while I have literally thousands in my backlog that I haven't even read yet. So I can't take every story, and I especially don't always take new stories that were just posted in a topic that has dozens of stories in my backlog. So I try to use older ones first. So be patient, but do remember that I cannot use every story right away, and there are people who have been waiting two years at this point, maybe three. I'm one guy, making videos as fast as I can, at the highest quality I can, so I apologize. Well then, that brings us to the end of this episode, but don't you worry, because more scary stories are coming soon, so hang in there. Until next time, here are the credits to my patrons who are incredible people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.